right, good morning, Three Circle. Good to have all of you here today. Really good to be back uh, with you. I know that uh, our pastors at all of our campuses did a great job last week uh, continuing the series on Ephesians. Before we dive in today, I want to just kind of have a little family moment. You know, we are a big church, but we're a family. And one of our own is really suffering right now, and I wanted to talk to you about that, and I want us to just have a moment of prayer. Uh, Todd Smith, uh, many of you know him, many of you do not. He was our executive pastor for a while at this church and did a great job leading, uh, helping lead our church through some, some really difficult times and, and really did a, a fabulous job. He still is on our staff in a way, uh, even though he works in the private sector now, he uh, was, is still a consultant to us, helps us with uh, the, the financial side of what we do as a church. His wife is Dana Smith, who's the director of our Hope Center. So Todd's a, 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 an integral part of who we are at Three Circle Church. And this past week, uh, Todd was diagnosed with a, a very dangerous and a very rare autoimmune disease that's attacking his body. And uh, he has started a very aggressive treatment plan um, and is in, a, is in a long battle and a long journey ahead of him. Uh, and I want to ask, all of our campuses are going to be praying for Todd today. I'm going to ask us to spend a moment just praying for a, for a few moments for Todd. And, and here's what we're going to pray for Todd and his family. He has two beautiful daughters who are both starting, one starting college this week and, and one's you know, starting school this week. So just a lot going on for this family. As you can imagine, their world's kind of turned upside down right now. So I want us to pray for healing, certainly. I want us to pray that God would use what we believe is a gift from him, doctors and medicine, to help heal Todd's body as well. And also I want us to pray for peace. All right? Now, the Bible promises that God will give us peace beyond uh, understanding. So I want us to pray for peace for Dana and Todd and their family as well. Could we just, I want to give you a moment if you would pray for Todd and his family right now. And then uh, I will close us in prayer. Thank you. But Father, we come to you by the access given to us by Jesus. And we ask you, Lord, uh, for Todd, our friend, our brother, part of leadership at this church, we pray for his healing. Uh, we also pray that you would use doctors and medicine to find out the best course of action to fight this disease that's fighting his own body. I pray for strength for him as he begins treatments, which we know are going to be tough and hard and involving things like chemotherapy and other things that are going to be really hard for him. I pray, God, for peace for he and his bride, Dana, and their daughters. And I pray that we as a church would do a really good job of coming around them and being strong for them and lifting them up in prayer. But Lord, we know that you are in control of all things and that you're not surprised by this. We don't understand, Lord, and we understand the futility of asking why. We instead want to know what. What can we do? What can we learn? What are you going to do in and through Todd's life? And we just pray for this family now. In the name of Jesus, we all pray together. Amen. Thank you, guys. In light of that, we're reminded today as we jump back in Ephesians again that we are a family. And, uh, you know, many of you suffer. Many of you have things going on. And again, there's a little card uh, that we always have there in the chairs for you to let us know what we can be praying for you about. And we really do pray every Monday during staff meeting, a major portion of that is praying over every need that comes in on one of those cards. So please do uh, fill that out so that, we can, so that we can pray for you and pray for those needs. Um, we're going to continue our study on Ephesians, go into the second half of chapter 5 today. And remember, as we look at this, what we've been doing is we spent the first half of Ephesians looking at theology, looking at what do we believe, what do we believe about the love of God. And now in the second half, we're getting into this idea of, okay, what do we do now with that? And what we're going to find is that the Apostle Paul, in writing this letter to the Ephesians, weaves in and out continually the idea of here's what we should be doing and then constantly reminding us that we do what we do as Christians because of what God has already done for us. So just remember, always remember, religion will tell you and the predominant way we uh, relate to God as humans, apart from the gospel, is that we think we've got to work for it, we've got to earn it. The gospel, that's religion. Religion says you do something for God to get Him to love you, to get Him to bless you. But the Bible teaches that God... And His love for us did something for us. 
And now out of that, we begin to do things for God and because of what He's done for us. And that idea is going to be very clear today. We're going to take a look at the love of God. The love of God. In fact, if you uh, grew up like me in a church, you probably heard this song and you can just help me with it. You ready? Jesus loves me. Before the Bible. Keep it going. To Him belong. But he is strong. Help me out. Yes. Oh, yes. And yes, Jesus loves me. Bible. Yeah. All right, such a simple song. How many of you are thankful for that truth, though, today? Can we just thank God for that simple truth? All right. There's a lot of truth packed into that song because, number one, it's a, it's a statement. Jesus loves me, okay? And then it's a statement of faith. This I know, and how do I know it? Because the Bible tells me. The Bible tells me from Genesis to Revelation that God loves me and that He has shown that love to me. If you want to write this down, in Christ, we are perfectly loved. In Christ, we are perfectly loved. That's a truth I want you to, to just really grab onto today. I want you to wallow around in it, all right? Just, just do that, okay? Because that truth will change your life. Remember, our identity in Christ, we're learning in Ephesians, who we are in Christ is all about the fact that you are loved by Christ. And we're going to learn that today. Now, this section of Ephesians is one of the most controversial sections of Scripture in the entire Bible. And you're going to know within the first three words why, all right? Some of you are already peeking and you already see it. But... <laughs> but the problem is we are missing the point, okay? We're missing the point of it, and I want to show you that today because the point of this section is actually to understand the love of God. Because here's the deal. If the love of God is to be an, a, a uh, foundation for us, we need to understand that love. If, if the love of God is supposed to be the fuel in the tank of my Christianity, I need to understand the nature of that love, and that's what we're going to do today. So we're going to read it, and then we're going to unpack it, all right? Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 22, you'll see why it is so controversial. Here we go. Wives, submit to your own husbands. Now do you know why people get so mad? <laughs> As to the Lord. You're going to find that Paul's going to tie these commands back to Jesus. Verse 23, just so you ladies see, ladies get mad on that first line, but they don't read the next line. It comes back around, all right? Watch, for the husband is the head of the wife, here it is, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And here comes something all you ladies should be amen in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Can I get an amen from the ladies in the house? All right. Verse 26, now we, get, we begin to see the activity of Jesus here that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, here it is again, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. Here it is. I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. All right, Lord Jesus, I just pray that you'd speak to us through your word today as we unleash the power of the scriptures in our lives and that you would help us to have understanding through the power of your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so as we look at this, what we're going to see is that Paul is going to give us, he takes, and by the way, in other places he uses the gospel and what Jesus has done for us to help us understand how we're to love other people, how we're to love our families, our friends. In this instance, he picks marriage. Is the idea he's going to help use to teach us about the love of Christ. And here what we see is we see wives submit to your husbands, and then we also see husbands love your wives, both of them being tied to the relationship with Jesus and the church. If you want to write this down, marriage is meant to be, first of all, an earthly reflection of the love of Jesus, 
for the church. And Jesus' love for the church is to be a model for our marriages. Okay? It's two-sided coin. On one side of the coin, your marriage, if you're married today, your marriage is meant, now, and I want you to grab onto this, your marriage is meant to be a reflection of the love of Jesus for the church. Your marriage has a purpose. This is something that marriages in the Old Testament wouldn't have fully understood. But in the New Testament, now that Jesus has died on the cross and everything's been cleared up, there's a new covenant, now we understand how much Jesus loves us, now the apostles began to teach that that love that Jesus displayed for us is to inform and to even guide the way we love our spouses and other people. Okay, That's what's happening here. Now, a couple of things. Let me just make clear. One thing Paul clears up here for us is the nature of marriage. Notice what he says. One woman, one man. One husband, one wife. Okay, so not to be militant or divisive here, I'm just teaching the Bible. We don't edit the Bible at Three Circle Church. We are not editors. We are teachers, okay? God doesn't need any help editing His Word. If you don't like a part of it, that, it it's still the Word of God, okay? The Bible makes clear here, under the New Covenant, the teaching of the apostles, one, here's marriage, one a man, one woman equals marriage. And there's one judge in the universe that decides that. And he does not sit in a courtroom in America. Okay? So let's just make that real clear. So at three circle, how do we define marriage? The way Jesus does. The way God does. We're a Bible church. Okay? So I always just say, I'm more than willing to hide behind the Bible. Don't get mad at me. I didn't write the book. God did. But I love the book. Okay? Now, some people have come to me before, and maybe you've gotten this question. Hey, Chris, why all the polygamy in the Old Testament? Why, why, why did that happen? Why are some of our biblical heroes, why were they polygamous, basically? Okay? And let me help you understand this, just real quickly, a little flyover, okay? You've got in, at, in the garden, watch this, Paul and the apostles are tying us back to the way God originally intended things to be. If you go back to the garden, you have one woman, one man, and the perfect idea of what marriage is supposed to be. Am I right? Adam, Eve, in the garden. You've got, you've got exactly what Paul's teaching here. Now, what happened in the garden? It all fell apart. It all came off the tracks. Okay, And then the rest of the Old Testament, you've got God doing a redemptive work, all of it leading to, all of it being basically previews to the main event of the cross that was coming. The Bible teaches us those guys could not see clearly. They began to see in part. They didn't even understand what the sacrifices fully meant that they were making. They didn't understand how the temple was set up. Of course, when Jesus came, everyone got it. The lights turned on. Everyone began to understand all of that. And now you have in Ephesians an example of one of the apostles with apostolic authority under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit writing God's Word and clearing up for us again. Here is the way God wants marriage to look. Does that make sense? In teaching the church, here is the way marriage is supposed to look. Marriage is one woman and one man in a committed relationship. Not multiple, all right? And also, it is lifelong. This is what God begins to teach. So what, what He does is the Bible lifts the idea of marriage. And see, I think, you know, we say this a lot around here, we want a high view of Scripture at Three Circle. High view. So this isn't just another book. It, it is the book. We have a high view. We have a high view of Jesus high view of God, high view of the gospel, high view of the church. I want to elevate what you think about church. I don't want you to attend church. Attending church is not what we want. We want to make disciples. Nowhere does the Bible, you can't show me one place in the Bible where the Bible says, hey, teach people to be church attenders. All right? Teach people to be good Baptists. Amen. No, I don't see any of that. No? I, you know what I see? I see make disciples. That's people that radically follow Jesus, okay? So what we want to do is elevate what people think about those things. Well, one of the things we need to elevate as well, and I think especially in the culture we're in, is we need to elevate what we believe about marriage, okay? In the church, I think we've started to water it down. We think that marriage, hey, has a door on it. You can walk in and out. Hey, if I get tired of how I feel about my spouse, I, you know, I'll just, I'll just walk right out of it. We have people teach from pulpits very watered-down versions and ideas of marriage, the constraints on marriage, how to walk in and out of one. You see it all over the place, okay? So let me make it real clear. We need to elevate what we think about marriage and what we believe about marriage because far be it from us as a church to shout and yell and bemoan what's going on in our culture if we don't have a high view of marriage ourselves. Are you with me, Three Circle? Okay? 
So we need to elevate what we believe about it, all right? Okay, so marriage has a very high calling. We are to model the love of Jesus for the church. That's the model. And the kind of love, so, so if we're to model it, we need to understand it. I need to know what kind of love that was. Well, the word that Paul uses here six times in this little section that we just read is the idea of agape love. Everyone say agape. I don't mess it up and go all southern on me and call it something like agape or something like that. That sounds like a fish, right? Hey, y'all, caught a pile of agape today. They're going to be good. We're going to fry them right up. No, no. Agape, all right? And what is agape love? It is unconditional and irrevocable love. That is the Greek word that Paul begins to use. It's very specific. It is very powerful. And that's the kind of love that we're, we're to model in our relationships, in particular in our marriages. But I don't want you to get... See, what a lot of people do is they read this section and they get in the ditch on the marriage stuff and they think that's what it's all about. The idea was for you to take the idea of marriage that most of us are familiar with and that is supposed to help you better understand the love of God. Does that make sense? And a lot of people just go, well, I'm just going to study this for my marriage. No, the idea was for this section to help you understand how God loves you. Because if you can get that you're so loved by Jesus, you will have a much easier time loving your spouse. Okay? It'll give you the grace. It'll give you the the things, the tools you need to actually be able to love your spouse this way. So Jesus loves the church in an unconditional and irrevocable way. The Bible says now there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ. And you didn't earn His love, did you? The Bible says while we were yet sinners in Romans 5, 8. He has given His life for us. So if you want to write this down, agape love is expressed in action Sometimes even despite our feelings. Agape love is not a feeling-driven love. It is an action-driven love. How many of you would agree that the cross shows forever that Jesus acted on His love for us, right? God's grace is an affection and an action. And the cross forever said, hey, I love you. And I'm going to show you I love you. Right? And you know what? My wife and I have a great marriage, but we don't have a perfect marriage. I know this is going to amaze some of you, and I hope it's not a huge shocker, but there are times I actually get on my wife's nerves. I know, I know. Uh, you know, there's lots of other churches in the community, so if that's too much for you to deal with, I totally understand. But I can promise you, they get on their wives' nerves too. They just might lie to you about it, okay? So there are mornings I wake up, and this is how it is at my house. Have I told you lately that I love you? You know? But then there are mornings where it's like, I don't even want to talk to you right now, okay? How many of you know what I'm talking about? You've been married long enough. Some of y'all, how many of you just got married? How many of you have been just got married in the past six months and you're here today? Oh, look, look how happy they are. Y'all look at them. Y'all see them? <laughs> look at them. Are y'all still going out to eat and stuff like that a lot, right? And movies and just, Y'all call each other from work. I love you. I love you more. Text now. Love you more. No, I love you more. <laughs> Isn't that nice, right? Okay. Hey, you hold on to that. That's good. What you're going to understand is in marriage, it's not always like that, and that's okay. Here's what's happened in our culture, in movies and romantic comedies and all that stuff, and Oprah, God help her, they've all told us these lies about relationships, okay? And it's that, hey, you need your soulmate. Can I just tell you how bad I hate that term, soulmate? Are you kidding me? Come on, man. Look, what you, listen. Marriage is something you choose to love someone. And some days it's really easy, and some days it's not, okay? And what's happened in our culture is on the days it's not easy, people go, oh my gosh, I didn't marry my soulmate. Oh no, we're, we're having a fight. I can't believe it. I made a mistake. I married the wrong person. And then what happens is they go find them someone else, and they fight with them too, right? Because they, you know... What you do is you, you, you blow it with one broken human being, you go find another broken human being, okay? That's how that works. So what we see is God modeling for us. Jesus says, hey, I loved you when you were always unlovable. I mean, let's be honest. Do any of you ever consistently earn the good grace of Jesus? If you're like me, some days I'm just going, I'm not sure why you don't strike me down. I'm being honest, Okay? And that's true of all of us, yet he just gives his love for us, and then he says, now this is how you're supposed to love each other, okay? So marriage begins to look like, watch this, 
Marriage becomes an environment where you can actually learn how to love like Jesus loves. There's nowhere else you can love like Jesus loves, like in your home and in your marriage. That's why, if I want to know who you really are, let me come see how you are with your spouse. That's where you begin. That's where the rubber hits the road. Because it's easy at church. Oh, bless you. God bless you. Oh, hallelujah. Love you. We love Jesus at our church. So nice to each other. You walk out there and get in that car, start yelling at each other before you get out of here. <laughs> and some of y'all, between yelling at each other, y'all trying to run over our parking team because you don't like those new parking <laughs> spots. My goodness. My parking guys are calling me every week. I got, you know, people won't back in the right way. They're mad at each other, you know. So the only, th what we've done is we've just gotten your attention off of each other. Y'all can stop yelling at each other and yell at our parking team some, I guess. All right? Because we're humans. We're just broken humans. And the Bible teaches us that we needed Jesus to model this for us, his love for us. I write this down. Jesus loves us with both affection and action. Okay? Agape love, which we're to model in our marriages... It's supposed to have affection, yes, but it's also supposed to have action. Action. I can't tell you how many times I have done marriage counseling for folks and they come in and I've had a lot of guys look at me and go, hey man, I'd take a bullet for her. I love that little lady right there, I'd take a bullet. And I always go, okay, that's easy. You do understand that's easy, right? That's not a big deal that you take a bullet for your wife. That you would die for your wife. Okay, good, good. Jesus didn't only die for us, He served us, lived 33 perfect years on our behalf, gave up everything for us. Jesus didn't give a one-time sacrifice. Jesus continually sacrificed and continually gives to us. So don't tell me you would die for your spouse. How about living for them? How about taking the trash out and not complaining about it? You see what I'm saying? It's not just, yeah, I die for you. It's, I love you every day. I serve you every day every day, even when I don't want to, even when I'm mad at you, even when you're on my nerves, even when I would rather be anywhere else in the world than with you right now, I'm going to love you and serve you. <laughs> All right? Are y'all following me today? That's what marriage starts to look like. And then we're not, hey, hey, and then we're not trying to do biblical acrobatics to try to figure out a way to rope Jesus' words around ways we can get out of our marriages. Okay? Then we're not trying that junk. Then we're saying, no, we're committed. We're in. We're in because that's the way Jesus loves us. The Bible also says that in Christ, the mystery of God's love and plan has been made known. Paul says here, he says, this in verse 32 is a mystery and it's profound and it refers to Christ in the church. So what, what, what was not known, and I want you, this helps you understand the Bible. In the Old Testament, they knew God loved them. Just so you know, God didn't, a lot of people think God was in a bad mood in the Old Testament, and then Jesus came and he got happy all of a sudden. Okay? It's like God was really, really grouchy, and then suddenly he got in a good mood and we got Jesus. Okay? God has never, you do understand that that would be problematic theologically since we believe that God is unchanging. Okay? God didn't change. Our perception of him did. What he did is he cleared up for everyone just how much he did love us. God's always been a God of grace. God has always been long-suffering. He picked a nation to birth a Messiah to take our place. You understand, God's always been coming after us in his grace and his love. And what Paul is saying here is, hey, the people of the Old Testament didn't fully understand that. They were doing all these sacrifices. They knew God was good, but they didn't know how good He was. They knew God loved them, but they just didn't know how much He loved them. But then Jesus came. And can we all agree, Jesus cleared that up really fast, didn't He? Jesus cleared up how much God loves us. Jesus cleared up just how good God is. Jesus made it and put it on full display, the love of God. So Paul says that mystery, very profound, but what was not known is now known. I don't have to wonder, does God love me anymore? I just look at the cross. I don't have to wonder if I matter. And you don't either. See, many of you are here today and you think because you've made mistakes. Maybe even as we talk about marriage, you think, well, I've, Chris, I've, I've nuclear bombed a marriage or two or three. I don't, I don't feel worthy to be sitting here right now. No, no, let, let me tell you. Let me tell you this. God is a God of forgiveness and grace, and thank goodness He's a God of redemption. And if you will let Him, He will redeem in you what the enemy has stolen and what you yourself maybe even chose. He will redeem in you 
what he meant to do from the very beginning. Your, your marriage now, your relationship now can be what God meant it to be. If you'll let him do that work in your life, and aren't we grateful for that, right? So I say to you today, don't feel the shame from the past. There's no condemnation for you in Christ. But do begin to take the marriage that you are in right now seriously and begin to see the beauty of it and what it's meant to be. Again, Romans 5, 8. God showed his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now the idea in the scripture that God continually uses to help us understand his love for us is that Jesus loves the church as a groom loves his bride. All right? Now for you ladies, that's easy. Most little girls, like my little girl Gracie at five years old, is already, you know, dressing up and doing all that stuff, and I'm sure that she'll start acting like she's getting married soon, which I'm going to shut down fast, all right? <laughs> Luckily, I'm still, you know, she's going to marry me. You know how that is with little girls, and I'm, I'm grateful that I'm still the hero, and hope, hopefully that's going to be that way for a long, long, long time, okay? This is a little harder concept, though, for the dudes in the room. I don't, you know, if I'm telling you, hey, you need to feel like a bride, I'm going to tell you right now, I will not look good in a wedding dress, okay? Okay, that's not happening, all right? Just, just not going to work. So I want to help you here. The Bible means for us to understand individually that we're children of God, men. As an individual Christian, you are a child, you're a son, you have a father, okay? You get that. But, but you need to understand God's love for the church. Collectively, we are a bride, Okay, And if you can, it, ladies, you, you totally get it, but guys, I need you to remember if you're married, the day that your wife, I, I remember standing at a church and watching the back doors of, of, of First Baptist North Mobile open up and my wife walking down the aisle with my grandfather right here and my good friends here and, and my dad and my brother and, and looking up and there she is, my bride. And I remember how I felt towards her right then. It was awesome, okay? Uh, when a man loves a woman, you know, that's how it felt right there, you know? It was good, okay? So, so watch this, guys. You need to understand that's how God loves us. That's how God loves us, okay? And, and wrap yourself around that, that he loves his church like a groom loves his bride. And, and Paul teaches us five ways that he does that. There's five things that we just read. You may have not seen them, but I want to show you these five ways. Number one, Jesus loves the church by being the head of the church. He is the head of the church. Look what it says. The husband, in verse 23, is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. What is headship? The Bible explains it like this. We had a father, a first father. His name was Adam. Didn't turn out so well, did it? He was probably a good guy, I'm sure. You know, pretty good at naming animals. All right, not sure where he got the mosquito thing, but you know. And he blew it. He and Eve blew it, and the Bible teaches us in Romans that he was the head of the human race. Why do you think Adam was? It's a very simple answer. Why was Adam the head of the human race? Why did he re represent the entire human race? Because he was the only one, okay? That's, he was the only one. There wasn't any others, all right? It was he and Eve. So headship. So the Bible teaches us that when Adam fell, we all fell. He represented the entire human race. He fell, we all fell, we all became sinners, and we've all been broken ever since, Okay? Gloriously, the gospel teaches us that then there was a second Adam. That language is used in the Bible. And who was that? Y'all help me out. Jesus. Jesus comes, and that same biblical idea of headship comes back in. And on the cross, Jesus is the head. He takes responsibility. He, he takes the place of humanity on the cross. The sins of the whole world, the propitiation of the sins of the entire world, according to 1 John, Jesus took upon himself. We call that the substitutionary atonement. So Jesus took our place as the head of the church. So watch this. He lovingly, one way he loves us is he takes responsibility for us. When I stand before God, I will have the righteousness of Jesus applied to my life. Jesus took my sin and gave me his righteousness pretty good trade, wouldn't you say? He's the head of the church. By the way, we say this a lot, I just to remind you again, he is the head of Three Circle Church, okay? I'm not the only pastor this church has ever had. I probably won't be the only pastor this church will have. One day, I'm going to be old, and you're going to get tired of me, okay? It's just going to happen. I know it is, and I'm just, you know, then I'll just, I'll walk around when I'm older and give the new guy a hard time, okay? Because I'm not going anywhere. I'll sit right back here and look at him, tell him to keep it a little shorter, all right? <laughs> All that kind of stuff. But I'm not the head of the church. 
Jesus is the head of the church, and we look to him that way, and we glorify him, and we worship him alone because he's the head of the church. The Bible also tells us here in Ephesians that he's the savior of the church. Look what it says. It says he's the head, and also in verse 23, he himself is the savior of the church. He saved us. The Bible says he came to seek and save those who were lost. Have you ever thought about what you'd be right now without Jesus? What if Jesus had not changed your life? Who would you be? Can any of you remember who you were before Jesus? Wasn't pretty, was it? Have you ever wondered and thought and let your mind go to what you would be without him? And Jesus saves us. He saves us from sin. He saves us from the wrath of God. You know, we have a great old ancient hymn that speaks of Jesus stepping in front of for us the wrath of God and taking it on himself. And by the way, the wrath of God was fully justified. God wasn't just in a bad mood. He had a good reason to be mad with us in a holy, wrathful way that would have led to our destruction. Yet Jesus stood in the way, got on the train tracks with the train coming right at him, and moved us aside and said, hey, you stand here, I got this, and took it upon himself. Okay? Jesus saved us. How many of you are thankful Jesus saved you? That he saved you? Yeah. Some of us in this room today have a hard time with that because to admit that he's a savior would mean that I admit that I need a savior. And none of us want charity, do we? Oh, I don't need your help. We're self-reliant. We're be-all-you-can-be Americans that really gets in the way sometimes. Okay? But you need a Savior. If you don't know Jesus today, you need a Savior. And just, I hope it makes you feel better that if you're struggling with that idea, all of us in this room were so screwed up and messed up, we needed a Savior. The only difference between you and me is that Jesus saved me, and you haven't crossed that line yet if you don't know Him. And He loves you and came to save you. Thirdly, Paul teaches us here that Jesus is the giver to the church. It says here in verse 25 that he gave himself up for her. He gave away his life for his church. Again, remember, all of this models how we're to be in our marriages. We're to be generous in our marriages. We're to be kind. We're to, be, we're to give our lives away. And I, I, I do, look, here, let me just challenge all of us for a minute here. It, guys, if I show up at your house and your wife's driving an old beater car, and the house is run down, and your kids you know, can't get the things they need, yet you've got some awesome four-wheel drive pickup truck, a boat, a couple of hunting clubs you're part of, and, and all that kind of stuff. I'm just going to know right off the bat that you don't love your family the way Christ loved the church because you're not giving yourself up for them. I think people forget that it is sacrificial. Yeah, it sure is. Okay, guys, if you're having a hard time with the fact that you don't get to play as much as you used to and have the hobbies you used to have and do all those things, let me just remind you of some, just one little fact. You got married. You're married now. All right? So it, with marriage comes sacrifice. That's part of it. It's a beautiful thing. It's an awesome thing. But you should be sacrificing on the part of your family. Yeah, and when the kids come into the picture, Absolutely. Men, and here's what happens sometimes, is men will take the scriptures that teach them that they're the head and the leader of their families, and they will use that, not in a way Jesus would, instead they will use it to prop themselves up positionally. When God designed it to be functional, and as a head of the church, as Christ was, we take on responsibility for our families. That means I'm way, I'm way more worried about my son Gabe becoming all he can be in Jesus, and I'll sacrifice whatever it takes for that, including my own comfort, including my own dreams, including my own wants. Okay? That's what real marriage looks like. Ladies, it is going to be hard to submit to your husband sometimes. Absolutely. That's not easy. Okay? My wife doesn't, I promise you, Nan does not wake up every day going, oh, I just can't wait to be in submission to Chris today. <laughs> uh, and I promise you, I don't always make it easy, okay? Yes, it's sacrificial. And all of that sacrifice is in a diminished way, but in a way showing what Jesus did for us. How many of you would say Jesus sacrificed more than you'll ever sacrifice? Isn't that right? Are you beginning to see how this works? As we understand the nature of the love of God for us, we begin to understand more what our marriages should look like. Yeah, it's not always easy. Yet we will sacrifice. I've got a really, I, I, I really got into golf about 10 years ago. No, about 12 years ago I got into golf. And I'm competitive, so I got into it. Got great clubs, all that kind of stuff, okay? I now play about once a year, all right? 
My clubs sit in the very back of the garage. Sometimes my kids get them out and just do stuff with them, okay? Right? Let me tell you why my golf career lasted two years. Because about 12 years ago, I started playing, and two years later, we had Gabe. And I realized real fast, four hours, right, on a Saturday morning, probably wasn't going to work very much longer. And as we kept adding kids, that time just got crunched, and at some point, you know what? I'm not, I'm not trying to tell you I got it all together, but I just went, I don't have time to do that anymore. I can play every now and then, but I'm going to have to find some different things to have fun, including these little rugrats that are in my house now. Okay? And that's called sacrifice. And I can whine about that, and <laughs> or I can be who God's called me to be. Are y'all with me on that today? You see that? The giver to the church. Jesus is also, fourthly, the sanctifier and the cleanser of the church. It says here, He Himself is the one, in verse 26, who sanctifies her and cleanses her. We saw the wedding dress video that we did for you guys a few weeks ago. Let me just remind you of that. Jesus cleanses you, and He is changing you, sanctifying you. He's actively working on you. Now, those of you who had little kids like me, I'll tell you right now, the PSI on a kid is unbelievable. I've had stuff hit walls. Y'all know what I'm talking about when they're little kids? It's like combustible, man. And stuff will go in all directions out of everything, okay, on a little kid, all right? But I remember when we had Gabe. I, I kind of had a weak stomach about stuff like that. And I thought, man, there's no, I don't know. I was terrified of changing a diaper. I'm just being honest with you, all right? I really was. I just can't do it, okay? I remember one time we, we babysat for this couple, and, and, and this little boy, he, just, he, had a, he had a nuclear bomb in his diaper, all right? It happened. <laughs> and, I, and Nan had gone to pick something up. It was me and the little boy, and I got a box. I couldn't do it. I got a box of popsicles. I got him to stand still. I'm on the phone with Nan. I'm giving him popsicle after popsicle, get, telling Nan, you got to get back. You got to get back. And I said, he, he'd get upset. I'm like, here, here's another popsicle, right? Don't worry, I admitted this to the mother, okay? She thought it was great. She thought it was funny. I couldn't do it. Here's what happened. Then Gabe came, my son. And you know what? I remember sitting there holding him in my arms and something clicked. All y'all know what I'm talking about, that click that happens. This is my boy. And suddenly, I didn't, I didn't care what he did. That's my son. Something happened deep inside of me. I could change a diaper. I'm telling you, I've had more stuff on me than you could imagine with three kids, man. I mean, y'all know what I'm talking about, right? How do they do it, and where does it come from? <laughs> and yet, you know what? I just kind of got over it because, look, because I had the responsibility to clean my kid, okay? Jesus takes full responsibility, and he showed it. Remember that night he washed his disciples' feet, even the one who was about to betray him? Hey, this is beautiful truth. You ready? Jesus will clean your mess. And let me make this clear. You are messy. And I am messy. How many of you are messy? Let's just be honest, right? Hey, Jesus cleans your mess. And he doesn't do it going, oh my gosh. Okay? No, no. Jesus gladly. Hey, Jesus doesn't tolerate you. He loves you. He embraces you. He does not just tolerate you. He loves you and embraces you and cleanses you and is actively changing you. And then lastly, and I love this, so that we understand the nature of the love of God and how it's to inform our marriages, Jesus is the nourisher and the cherisher of the church. Look what it says in verse 29. It says, no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. Jesus cherishes you, and he cherishes us together as the church. Loves and cherishes us and nourishes us, feeds us, makes sure you have what you need, okay? Now think about that. Do you see how that changes everything? It changes everything. My friend Todd is lying in a hospital room right now. I met with him last night as we were talking. Great courage as he's facing a very difficult time. I don't know why. Todd is going through what he's going through. And I don't know why many of you are suffering right now. But I know this. I know this. Jesus loves you. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. And, and, and the Bible seems to want us to wrap ourselves around that to the point that that is enough. 
that you go, you know what? I am loved by God. I am loved by Him. I am cherished by Him. And He will nourish me. He gives you what you need when you need it. And, and one of the big ways He does it is, is with the Word of God. He nourishes you and has given you the revelation of God in the Word, okay? God loves us. And that becomes the fuel in the tank. It becomes the identity that we have. And I don't know about you, but I can be very unlovable sometimes. <laughs> Yet God loves me. In fact, there is nothing you can ever do to make God love you more or less. Nothing. There's nothing you will ever do to make Him love you less. Do you understand that? He's never retributive. He's not paying you back. He always is corrective and helping you. You will never do anything to make Him love you more than He does. Okay, just, hey, if you have a good week, this week as a Christian, He's not going to love you more. He's not going to be more proud of you. He loves you. That's hard for us as humans, isn't it? Because our love's not quite like that. We're still trying to get there with this agape stuff. God's already there. And He loves you, even when you're an absolute mess. He loves you. Let's do it like this. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8 is famous because it's the love verses. The Bible says God is love. We believe Jesus is God, so therefore I do think it's appropriate to read this the way I'm about to read it, inserting the name of Jesus. Jesus is patient and kind. Jesus does not envy or boast. Jesus is not arrogant or rude. Jesus does not insist on his own way, is not irritable and resentful. Jesus does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Jesus' love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things, and Jesus' love will never end. I'm grateful for that truth, aren't you? We'll end it by saying this, because we're loved, we love. Because we are loved, we love, okay? This has to begin, so all of that about how God loves us has to begin to inform how we love. How we love our spouse, how we love others is sacrificial. Let me tell you two places I think are the best environments to learn how to love like Jesus loves. Number one, marriage. Secondly, community, okay? I'm going to ask you over the next few weeks to be a part of a small group. We're about to kick off small groups. And we're going to have our big group launch event, which helps people get in groups. And I'm looking at several of my small group folks right here. And I, I love, they are some of my best friends. Okay, we couldn't even make it the summer without getting together. So we got together and played some kind of game. What was that thing we played? Bunko or something like that? Man, that was crazy. Wow, these people get serious about this stuff, all right? And I love it, man. I love my small group. We cry together, pray together, laugh together, eat together. Thank you, Jesus. People cook, bring food. It's great. Small groups are awesome. But what we need as a growing church is we need some of you to go, you know what, I'm going to sacrifice and I'm going to lead a group. Some of you need to go, hey, me and my wife, we're going we're gonna to begin to model this kind of love. We're going to lead a group. We need more leaders. And that's a good thing because we have so many people. Okay. In your handout, there's a little card that if you would even consider this next year and semester being a leader of a group, because we'll help you, we'll train you, We'll help you big time, okay? Would you, you're not saying yes, you're just saying I'm, I'm willing to talk about this. Fill that out, and at every exit, there's a little basket you can put in, or also you can, you can sign up online, okay? And let us know, yes, I'm willing or open to talking about being a group leader. It, it'd be awesome. I lead my group, and uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's, it's a great thing. And it's in that community that we can model that agape love for one another. So would you consider this year saying, hey, I'm going to lead a group, and we'll help you get people in that group, come alongside you, and begin to model this agape love in our marriages and in our church community. Because you can't do that alone, all right? Would you bow your heads with me for just a few moments? And I'd love for you to just take a moment and respond. Some of you, your responses need to be, God, help me model this in my marriage because my marriage does not look like this. Some of you need to just thank Jesus for loving you the way he does and actually embrace that. Some of you need to stop trying so hard, literally. You need to stop trying to jump through religious hoops to make God happy. You can't do that. Secondly, Jesus has already done it for you. Jesus did all of the religious stuff for you now you are loved you're just loved nothing can ever change that you are loved 
Lord Jesus, we are grateful for your love for us, and we pray that it would come alive in us, that it would drive everything we do, in particular today, our marriages. Help us to love our spouses the way you love us, with agape love that has both action and affection. And it's in the strong and mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen.